Welcome everyone to the January 25th, 2021 meeting of the Carpinteria Unified School District. Andy, can I get a roll call, please? Aaron. Here. Jamie. Here. Sally. Here. Jamie. Here. And I'm here. Great. January 25th, 2022. My apologies. I even wrote down 2021. Okay. Can we please write a flag Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, we'll begin tonight with item B2, approval of the minutes for the regular meeting of January 11th, 2022. Two. <laughs> okay, a motion to approve. Move to approve. I'll second. Any uh, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item B2B is approval of the minutes of the special board meeting closed session on January 18th, 2022. May we get a motion to approve? Move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item B3 is approval of the agenda and consent agenda for tonight's evening. Tonight's meeting. May we get a motion to approve? Move to approve. I'll second. Okay. Right. And roll call, Andy. Aaron. Aye. Jamie. Aye. Sally. Aye. Jamie. Aye. And I'm I. Great. Right. Okay. Item D1 is our student representative report, who does not appear to be here this evening. So move right along to our superintendent report. Uh, thanks, Jamie. So tonight I'd like to begin with some appreciation in recognizing and thanking the site administrators, teachers, staff, and the district nurse for their calm and steady leadership and service for our school communities during this latest pandemic crisis. Their relentless focus on students and student well-being fosters a positive and reassuring school climate. The next item is our absentee rates. Uh, during the Omicron surge these past weeks, the student absentee rate has been approximately 17% with staff absences under 10%. However, today uh, there's still been a reduction. We had less than 13% of our students absent and less than 5% of our staff. We've been um, very fortunate I'm, and I am grateful for adequate substitute and colleague coverage of classes these past two weeks. COVID-19 public health guidance for K-12 schools in California. On January 12th, the CDPH updated the COVID-19 public health guidance for K-12 schools, which provided improvements in managing students exposed to COVID-19 in a K-12 setting including individual level quarantine recommendations and additional group tracing strategy. These updated protocols, protocols can be found on the district website. Last week, CUSD distributed more than 4,000 COVID-19 test kits to all CUSD students, so that was two tests per student. Staff and students may also participate in free testing with aptitude clinical diagnostics at the district office, which is weekly for staff or Earl Warren Showgrounds in Santa Barbara, which is also for staff and students. And then this week we'll be distributing additional test kits, one per student in partnership with the city and public health. <coughs> 2,000 new Chromebooks for students are being distributed at all school sites. Librarians and office staff are checking out the Chromebooks to students in Aries by scanning in the serial numbers. All old Chromebooks will be repurposed for classroom sets in grades K-3 and all remaining Chromebooks will be distributed to all the schools for extras when loaners and replacements are needed. We're also piloting a new screen monitoring software, DYNO, for CMS, CHS teachers to eliminate distractions on the Chromebooks and increasing student engagement. CMS after school soccer. We have 60 CMS boys and girls participating twice a week on separate teams in the CMS after school soccer program and it's led by coach Francisco Andrade and Michelle Dario. First semester grades at CMS and CHS. I'm happy to report that 74% of our CMS students earned a 3.0 or higher GPA with a school average GPA of 3.27 and 60% of CHS students earned a 3.0 or higher with a school average of 3.0. And then if you look at the comparison of students with D's and F's, we compared 2020 this year with 2018 and 19. And this year, our ninth and 10th graders 
had less D's and F's than in 2018 and 19, and our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders had less D's and F's than 2018, 19. Now, the caveat is we, we are talking about different groups of students, but the trend is going in the right direction. And I attribute that to the after school tutoring that's available. The last item is Measure U. Um, Summerlin School is formed and ready for concrete, which began this week. The CHS administration building started the roofing insulation with a short pause for rain. The first layer of roofing it will waterproof the roof in the event of more rain before the final roofing layer. Lathing installation will begin this week and will seal the building to be watertight. Both projects have been affected by the COVID-19 labor shortages, which will affect some slower progress but that will improve over the next few weeks. And then um, please visit the, our Measure U website. We have some great photos and footage from um, drones of the construction progress, which I've been foraging you some of the photos. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Anybody have any questions? Great, we'll move on to item D3. We have with us this evening a presentation from Daniel Phillips with the National Demographics Corporation. This is in regards to the transition from at-large elections to two trustee area elections for the Carpenter Unified School District Governing Board. This is the second presentation uh, by the National Democra Demographics Corporation. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And good to be with you again. And. Uh, so I'm back to uh, give you another presentation on the transition of by trustee area elections. And uh, this is gonna be very, very similar to what I uh, already presented and that's by design. The, the law is written in such a way that it wants a, an essentially identical presentation for two separate meetings for the benefit of anyone who wasn't able to be there for the first meeting. So. I will probably be briefer than I was uh, last time, but uh, I will have to run through everything again. So the uh, election systems are uh, as follows. You have at large, you have from trustee area, and you have by trustee area election systems. And so up to this point, you have been using the app. Well, it's kind of complicated, your election system that you've been using, but um, <laughs> It's, it's mostly at large, and then um, there is a from trustee area component in that a, one trustee has uh, uh, needed to live in Summerland, but they could still be voted on by everyone across the district. And so the, the third system, the by trustee area system, is one in which you have a trustee who lives in a certain area, and they can only be voted on by residents of that area. And that third system is the one that you're switching to in order to be, um, I wouldn't say in compliance, uh, maybe a better uh, word would be to, to say that you're, you're aligned with the, the spirit of the California Voting Rights Act. Um, because as we've talked about in previous meetings, there's no specific requirement that you have the by trustee area system, but it's written in such a way that it's it's much easier to be held liable for racially polarized voting if you don't have that system. It was written to specifically encourage the by trustee area election system. So that's that's why you're moving to that system so that you're uh, you're you're safer uh, from from the threat of lawsuit. And so this legislation, also known as the CVRA, was passed and it was. Uh, it was uh, the 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 thrust of this legislation is that liability is now determined only by the presence of racially polarized voting. So, if it can be shown that there is some difference between how uh, people from protected classes vote and people uh, from other groups vote, then then that would be a justification potentially for for a lawsuit. And so. The practical effect of the CVRA is all of these jurisdictions, school districts, special districts, cities, uh, community college districts, they are switching to this, uh, 
this third election system so that they are not at risk of being sued and having to to pay money to uh, the plaintiffs in either settlements or court cases. And you'll see here the large amounts of money that have been spent trying to fight a, uh, a claim under the CBRA. And to this point, no jurisdiction has fully and successfully def defended itself against such a claim. So in order to transition to this new election system, the, the state law has laid out a, a procedure by which you had to hold four total public hearings, and two of them had to take place before any draft maps are presented. So tonight is the second of those. And then we will release draft maps on February 1st and post those to the district website in that uh, because the law specifies that it be posted seven days in advance of the first of the post-draft hearings. So uh, it will give uh, the board and members of the public plenty of time to review the, the maps that are, that are being proposed. And so February 8th will be the first of those post-draft hearings and then February 23rd will be the, the second and the last total of the uh, of all hearings, of all four. So we also are recommending that you uh, schedule an adoption hearing for February 23rd as well. There can be two hearings that take place at the same meeting. And so assuming that during that last public hearing, you'll be able to arrive at a consensus around one of the maps, then you can formally adopt that on February 23rd. And that would almost be the last step, although there is a um, there is a, a, an extra hearing held by the county. Um, it's kind of a mouthful. The the county uh, committee on school board organization is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, and that will be, I believe, in March, and that will be the final rubber, rubber stamp on the on the the plan that you adopt, and then that will uh, go to the registrar and then they'll implement the the district or the trustee area boundaries in time for the november 22 election the uh the federal and the there's actually no state legal criteria for drawing trustee areas it's just federal legal criteria and the the federal laws state that the trustee areas be equal in population that they not uh, dilute the voting influence of a protected class group of people in accordance with the Federal Voting Rights Act, and that they not engage in racial gerrymandering, where you make race or ethnicity the only our main consideration. So if you have uh, ensured that all three of those federal laws are satisfied, then you may consider any of the traditional principles that you see on the right-hand side, such as uh, respecting communities of interest, whatever those might look like, drawing areas that are compact, that are contiguous, that follow visible boundaries, that respect voters' choices, i.e. Uh, the continuity in office for the, for the board, and uh, any planned future growth. So all of those are optional, so it's up to you the degree to which you want to uh, adhere to any or all of those. This slide shows the demographics for the district, and you'll see that there's a lot of information here, and so we encourage you to, if you want, to look at this uh, and, uh, and really delve into a lot of the, the data about housing and, and immigration status and, and voter turnout and registration and, and that sort of information. but. Um, the key take home here is that each of the five trustee areas must contain about 3,600 people. And you get that by taking the total district population of 18,058 and dividing that by five, and that's your ideal population. You can stray from that ideal a little bit, but not too far. You had to be within a threshold of 10%. And you see the racial ethnic breakdown of your district here where 
uh, two fifths of the total population are Hispanic, but when you look at those who are eligible to vote, the citizen voting age population, it's a, a quarter of, the po of that population. When you consider uh, the citizen voting age population, or CVAP, and specifically uh, the la Latino CVAP, you see that the, uh, those group of people are concentrated in West Central Carpentria and also off Baylord Avenue. Uh, there are no significant concentrations of other protected classes. So uh, it's, uh, it's really just uh, Latinos that are the, 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 and the group that would have a significant size to be mindful of for the Voting Rights Act. When it comes to thinking about neighborhoods or communities of interest that you might want to be mindful of, you'll see renters are concentrated in Central Carpentria near the waterfront. So it's the, the darker, the, the warmer color, you might say, with uh, any, anything that's uh, red or, or maybe orange or green would be a, a high concentration there. In this case, we're looking at uh, those who earn more than $75,000 per year. And so the, the reds and orange indicates where, where more of them are concentrated. And that would be Northeast Carpentria and the foothill areas. Another way of thinking about neighborhoods or communities of interest could be land use or zoning. And here you see that you have lower density housing, uh, the yellow color, concentrated in, in Northern Carpentria. And uh, there is also a neighborhood uh, on the south side of the freeway as well. And you have more medium density housing and commercial uses downtown and along the freeway. Those would be the orange and red colors. A final way to think about uh, potential uh, communities of interest could be the uh, elementary school attendance areas. There, there are three in the district. You have uh, Summerland in the west. You have uh, Aliso, which uh, takes in western Carpentria and Toro Canyon and much of the outlying areas. And then Canalino gets eastern Carpentria. So this is the final slide, just to uh, prompt further discussion, if there is any, about any of the traditional principles you might want to consider or prioritize. And also a reminder about the interactive review map that we've made available. When the draft maps are available and ready to be posted, we will post PDFs on the district website, but we'll also post them as layers to the interactive review map. So you can go in and zoom in and, and look at where the boundaries are exactly. And you can, you can compare the different, uh, different plans to one another. So um, thank you for your attention and, and happy to take your questions. Thank you, Daniel. Do we have any questions to address that were not addressed last meeting? Um, I just have a quick question. Um, so we have the first post draft post map hearing, and then we have a second one, which you're suggesting we also uh, have a second hearing at that, I guess a third hearing at that point, um, to adopt. If there is a large, uh, I don't know, if, if the room was then flooded with people who disagree with how the maps are, would we then be able to postpone or would we have to vote that night still like if people were like we need more time we don't agree with this if there was just is that something that or is that we're on a hard time like this is this is already set uh we have we have enough time to have another meeting do we have enough time yeah i guess yes. my question is do we have enough time for a third meeting yeah, march 14th is our is when we have to present to the county okay i'm not suggesting that there would be i mean there's nobody that's come so far to comment but um, just wondering. Yes. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate your time today. You're welcome. We're going to go ahead and move on to D4. This is a public hearing on the second public meeting of the district's transition to trustee area elections redistricting. I'm going to go ahead and open the me meeting. Do you have any comments, Monica? 
All right, the meeting is now closed. We'll move on to item D5, public comment. Any public speakers tonight? All right, we'll move right along to item E1 then. This is board policy and administrative regulation 7211, developer fees. This is the first reading. May I get a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. A second? Second the motion. Thank you. Is there any questions on this item? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Item E2 is Board Policy and Administrative Regulation 5141.4, Child Abuse Prevention and Reporting. This is the second reading. Make a motion to approve. Move to approve. The second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item F1 is the 2021 Schools Accountability Report. The board is asked to approve the 2021 Schools Accountability Report card for Carpenter Unified School Districts February 1st of each year. Every school in California is required by state law to publish a School Accountability Report card. The SARC contains information about the condition and performance of each California public school. Under the local control funding formula, all local educational agencies are required to prepare a local control and accountability plan which describes how they intend to meet annual school specific goals for all pupils with specific activities to address state and local priorities additionally data reported in in lcap is to be consistent with the data reported in the sarc may i get a motion to approve move to approve i'll second that all right and is there any questions on the item well it's a big discussion if we do um <laughs> I just noticed there were there were I, I was reviewing the um, uh, on the Aliso. I kind of just glanced over all of them, and it wasn't really a question. It was just an observation on the um, the CASP scores, and and it seemed like there was a a, a, a um, discrepant or not a, disc a, a fairly sizable difference in CASP scores um, between the two schools on the uh, like on the I, elementary schools on the elementary between schools yeah. Yeah. yes yeah. so I just want to remind everybody about CASP of um, 2021 the scores really are not yeah. valid yeah so I'm surprised that um, that they were published but we did not we had um, adequate participation from elementary although a number of our students did not take the test but they really are not valid given uh, the year we had with the COVID yeah. last year so there is um, both so elementary schools they weren't required then because I noticed there was a big there was a big difference between the enrollment and yes. the number tested yes was, yes so, so it wasn't required of students okay. and right. many families opted not to t take the test uh, we were very similar in our um, scores at the English language arts for both elementary schools, but the difference was in math. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then we had discrepancies between um, male and female students. We did, significant. And I think you all noticed that um, as the students uh, progressed through the grades, the discrepancy was uh, bigger in English language arts especially. That's yeah. very notable. And it's something that we're aware of and that uh, we continue to the one thing that was, uh, and I guess you, you've, you've focused on it, before, you've mentioned it before, but the number of English learners, um, I, I got to commend our staff because the number of English learners from the elementary to the uh, high school level, the reclassifications is, is, is significant. And, you know, the number of English learners at the, at the secondary level is, is has been de diminishing yeah. over the years, which is a real testament to to the to elementary the, staff. To the elementary staff. They yeah. are really focused yeah. on reclassifying their students by fifth grade because we all know that if you're not reclassified by fifth grade, the academic demand is so high that you're really going to struggle in middle school and high school. So that's been a real focus in the last few years. There were, there were, I mean, I, I know we probably shouldn't focus on the overall results here, but there were some little bits of it that were interesting. I mean, there's a lot of data, or a lot of information to to, to um, digest, um, but there were some interesting. You know, it had didn't have so much to do with the test scores as it had to do with, like I just mentioned, the reclassifications. Yes. And 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 our actual demographics are, are um, the I, even with this redistricting. I'm the the demographics of Carpinteria are 
are uh, quite a bit different than I original uh, than than you would presume just based on observations. You know, uh, they've changed significantly. They have. In the they've last changed quite a bit. Ten years, especially. Yeah. 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 I Thank just you. had a question on the um, the Summerlin report. There's a couple of different places where there are no females. Yes. That are reported. Because if you don't have enough, you don't have ten. Oh, okay. You, you need to have more than 10. Okay. Yeah, so they don't report it because it's too individualized. Okay. And the other question I had um, was that in the, uh, the areas on from Daniel, um, there's a lot of Hispanic surnames that live in a variety of areas throughout Carpinteria that have been in Carpinteria for generations. Um, and they seemed, you know, he, he is... This has nothing to do with this, but uh, it sort of does. But, um, you know, the, he's stating that the concentrations of Hispanics are down at Baylor and or in town, whereas there are Hispanics living all over town. That he's kind of indicating that some of, many of those areas are basically just white areas. I, I don't think that's no. what he's, no. I don't think that's what he's, that that's what I'm, he's telling yes, us. Yes, I'm sure he's not telling us no, that. No, I think he's telling us that, um, that there's... A, it's the concentration piece, not yeah. that there aren't um, Hispanic Any, families living everywhere. all over Carpinteria. Yes. No, I think it's about the concentration. Yeah. Talking about. Is this, I, for some reason, I, I thought this would be more of a presentation than us running through it. I, is this in past, has the report card, the CAST reporting, been a presentation? When the CAST scores are valid okay. and reliable. Gotcha. We take the time to discuss them. Okay. But the reason why it's not a presentation or a discussion is that I don't think it's worth our while to spend time on scores that really don't reflect what our students are performing at. I think the more valuable discussion will be at the end of this year when we look at the data in relationship to our goals. And do you see the CASP as something that's going to be around for a long time? Absolutely. Like, I just feel like a lot of people, myself included, like I well especially last year I felt like it was way too much for for kids in the middle of everything they had been going on dealing with for so long I felt like it was an undue burden and I don't feel that it's necessarily an equitable test to begin with that's my own personal thoughts and I know there are a lot of other people and I feel like I don't know I've heard things through the grapevine through news outlets different things um about what what is the future of CASP and and if it's really worth the time uh is it the right tool for the job really i guess and are we teaching for this test or are we is it really capturing and the best use of classroom time i think there's three points there's that, kind of that a i can different things. respond to i think the first point was we were surprised i think educators were surprised last year that it was not waived given the given the circumstances of the pandemic and so that was surprising, and we all would agree that it seemed um, unreasonable to participate in CASP testing. The second point is the state will always have an accountability system, and whether it's CASP or a different type of test, the state will always be um, evaluating the performance of students in the academic areas. And let's see, the third point it's not going anywhere. No. No. <laughs> That's your point. Yes. Although yeah. the, you do it, feel it, 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 may, it may not be called CASP. It may be oh. called STAR testing, like it was, oh. or it may be called some other acronym that that is you know that they come up with. But there's always going to be same leopard, about. different. Spots. Oh, I do have a third point. Yes. Okay. We we don't teach to the test. Okay. We teach to the um, academic and performance standards in the academic areas, and the, of course a state assessment that is valid and reliable is aligned to those uh, standards. Okay, thank That's you. why we really focus on uh, the goals that we develop. Thank you. Yeah. But there's certainly been lots of tests over the years. You know, they do change it. And I know that um, all the standards, the very specific standards that came into play, probably in the 80s. Yes. Um, you know, that's what set the tone for all the testing since then. then. But it is definitely higher level thinking skills. You know, and if the teacher is teaching appropriately, then she's gonna teach how to answer those questions using your higher level thinking skills. Okay, thank you.
Any other questions? All right. This needs an approval. Yes. I'll, I'll move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Item G1, the board is asked to approve the warrants for the period of January 7th, 2022 through January 20th, 2022 in the amount of $1,182,508.97. May I get a motion to approve? Move to approve. And a second. Second. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item G2A, we have a donation from La Centra Summerlin through Carpentry Education Foundation to the Carpentry Unified School District Robotics Program in the amount of $200,000. May I get a motion to approve? I move to approve with great gratitude. I got to sign that check this afternoon. It was like, whoa. That <laughs> was very exciting. May I get a second? A second. Okay. Right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Item G3 is a memorandum of understanding renewal between the Carpentry Unified School District and Carpentry Children's Project for 2022 through 2025. Can I get a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Any questions? Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item H1 is the additional logos. Oh, these are Measure U items. So H1 is additional logos on gym wall padding from Gillervay Construction at the Carpentry High School. The cost to add the logos is $2,148.12, uh, all paid by Measure U funds. May I get a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I had a question. What kind of logos are they? You didn't kind of specific talk about that. McGillivray logos or? No, 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 no. CHS. CHS. Athletic. Yeah. Right, oh, the, the CHS C logo. Yes, yeah. okay. Feathers. Oh, got yeah. it. Yeah. Got it, yeah. okay. All right. Item H2 is installation of weight bench anchors in the gym weight room by McGillivray Construction. Uh, this is the cost to install the weight bench anchors in the amount of 4,404.84 paid by Measure U phone funds. May I get a motion to approve? Move to approve. And a second. A uh, second. Is there any questions on this item? Okay, motion to approve? Nope. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 <laughs> All right, item H3 is the approval of Robert Ro Robles Architecture Incorporated. This is the final fee reconciliation for elementary school campus modernization at Aliso. Uh, the board is asked to approve an increase to the Roberts Robles Architecture Incorporated Agreement for Lisa Elementary School Campus Modernization Phase 1, 2, and 3. On February 14, 2017, the board approved the proposal for professional architectural services at Lisa Elementary School for $419,650. Based on a percentage scale based on the district's construction cost of $3,921,502. The final construction cost of Aliso Phase 1, 2, and 3 is 7 million resulting in a fee to them of 731051 This is an increase of 311 I get a motion to approve? I'll, I'll move to approve. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm, I'm assuming you have lots of questions on this. Yes. So, so what happened here? I mean, it, really? It, was it okay. uh, and I had a lot of questions too. So in the original agreement in 2017, um, uh, and it's attached to the item, on number 10, it's that the fees uh, are completed, are paid and trued at the end of construction. So um, here we are at the end of construction for Aliso, so they're trued up. I had a long conversation with Robert Robles, the architect, on is this standard? I mean, it kind of caught me off guard too because uh, the purchase order was only for the 419650 that was approved in 2017. Mm -hmm. However, there were uh, purchase order increases over the over a couple of years to pay out additional monies, um, and those did not come before the board. Uh, probably what what needs to happen, what probably should have happened is when it says district's construction budget should not have included, included one out of three phases, it should have included all of the phases. So then you would have had timed billing through the entire set of projects. So in this case, the contract in 17, and I wasn't <coughs> um, part of that, 
only constituted phase one of the ELISA modernization, and it was calculated based on that amount only. Um, and then he has not been paid, you know, uh, um, timely billing based on future construction. So we are at closeout now of ELISO. So he wasn't billing us for the work for phase two Per contract, three? he couldn't. The way this contract was written is that uh, but until was it, it was a it was a he was getting a percentage of the gross is that is that what the things a, were based on? Well, the on? scale is the scale is a it's like a DSA scale of architect fees. Yeah, it's standard. Um, this the contract was written and he says it's not that untypical um, that until such time construction is completed, normally the, it's one project, and the whole project cost is included, and then you would have these percentage payments, and then it would be closed well, out. Well, but because we did a lease over several years. But why did, but each phase we had, each phase that we approved, we, I, I thought there were, there were uh, design fees associated with those. There we there we had one contract for the entire Aliso project. So he's been cash flowing this? Yep. He has not, and we've reconciled it. We've gone back through all of the documents and he's not been uh, given any uh, fees against the schedule since the initial 419. So these are just architectural fees? Yes. And the scale that's in here, where it has a 12%, you know, the scale down, that's, ver that's a DSA standard architectural fee for school projects. Right. So that's not his. That's, you'll see that in right. and it, everyone's. And it's, uh, it, I mean, it is budgeted, too. I mean, mm -hmm. we, the, 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 the percentage of the project, um, I mean, the, the architectural fees are budgeted into the cost of the project. Correct? Well, I'm, no. I'm saying that as a statement, but <laughs> partially as a question. A statement because question I think slash. Yeah. Uh, I will say that no. Uh, what was budgeted was the 419. We didn't budget the additional no. fees. No. They weren't um, per, even in the even in the master budget. No. So, like I explained, what is what should happen, and we're moving into like the final phase for Canalino. Um, and I'm, I'm reviewing that right now and having staff go through documents. It's the same, going to be the same thing. Um, but I, um, I will not, uh, I will make sure that for all of the projects moving forward, because we only have two projects that already have DSA approval from Canalino to finish out their modernization. But for the remainder of the projects, this agreement has to include the entire construction cost, even though you're phasing it. That's really what should have happened. Um, even though it's an estimate in a point in time that's like outdated, it still should have capsule, capsule, captured, excuse me, the whole construction, ag you know, agreement. Um, so, he, so Robert's floated so, this. So I, I don't, I think when we had been given the presentations, Measure U presentations, you know, before you took over, over everything, mm -hmm. when Cindy was still doing it, she had an architectural number in there, a design, a design number that she was plugging. And that didn't get carried over into the budget? No. So moving forward, how is that large, much larger number going to affect the rest of the projects on that original list? Um, because we took so much scope out of Eliso, we took, we took like 300,000 plus out of Eliso when we didn't do the kitchen. Right. I think it's going to true itself up. Okay. We're doing that reconciliation now for the closeout um, costs. Uh, but, you know, this was one of those things where I just kind of cringed. Like, what? Um, and, I, and like I said, I had a long conversation with Robert about, you know, honestly, Robert, <laughs> this, this is shocking to me. I mean, you, you haven't been paid this for like three years. It, it, to, it's the project scaled up each year. And, um, it, and he did say that this is very typical language, but the construct of this agreement at the time was not so typical about only doing a phase cost of budget. Did, did, he, did he say why he didn't, didn't ask for a, a, a increase in his purchase order at the beginning of each new phase of construction? Uh, we had that conversation and he did express some of the reasons he didn't bring it forward. Hmm. All right. 
When's so, our next Measure U presentation? Uh, that was going to be my next comment. So one of the things that I'm doing both for the um, Oversight Committee for the April meeting and for the board in April is I'm going to be doing a, um, another update that, in, that captures costs to date. And we're going through all of the completed projects, the projects we have, and we're building in as true a cost as we can. And I'm hoping at that point um, for the rest of the Canalino projects and main school at least, we can have some updated construction cost numbers because those are outdated numbers for the next phase of construction. And uh, in order for us to update that, we have to um, award a lease lease back contractor, which I'll be bringing to the board at the second meeting in February, a recommendation for contractor. And then we can get some actual true construction cost numbers for the unfinished projects because those are very outdated. And I, I've been concerned that they, they don't have a true reflection of what today's price will be. So how, do you have a, a general idea of how many projects are still left on that list? Well, we know that uh, in the prioritization that we took last September, Canalino um, remaining phase that's been approved by DSA is the ECLC, the admin building, and the multipurpose room. We're not doing the kitchen and, and one classroom. And then what hasn't been through DSA is the library, the learning center. Um, so that will finish Canalino, all those projects. Um, and those were like in the top, top set of priorities. Uh, Aliso is a high priority, but those projects, the, the K-Wing, until we get new site uh, flood maps and uh, zoning, where we don't have to elevate that, it's going to be delayed for some time. Um, and then the rest of the projects um, were, will probably be further down the line when we get some state funding, uh, with the exception of Main School. And we're still working on Main School. On the, the painting. Roofing and the painting. Mm -hmm. So I'll be bringing a better thorough update in probably the second meeting of April. Are you going to be going through any other contract to see if oh, there's any yep. loose ends like this? Because this is this is yep. egregious. This is are, awful. Yep. Um, so what we've done, what I've asked. And I, to, sorry, yes, I guess I'm sorry. I feel like when when you, I mean, I feel like like Sally has asked like, is this going to throw other things off? I I I don't see how it can just even out because yes, we had redu reduced costs at Aliso, but we have since had such increases in other areas. The overall budget, mm -hmm. it's a hit, mm -hmm. and it's because some people were really irresponsible. I feel. Like, and this is not the first time we've had an issue right. that we've found. But and one, one and of the, yes, and I, I don't mean to cut you off. One of the things that I'm doing is I am going through every, so, so what happens with construction, because they're project-based, right? They happen over multiple years. Um, purchase orders are issued, and they're carried year over year with the balances, and that's how it should work. Uh, that wasn't always the case. And right now we're going through any outstanding purchase order from any prior year reconciling it to the project and creating new that reflect the full project moving forward. So not only is the financial system in line, but we can report accurately. And we're still, we are with the current projects based on the current estimates we have that of the future projects. We're on, we've got all of that in and that's all reconciled, but they're outdated numbers. And until we get a lease lease back contractor nailed in for the future Canalino modernization and for main school, although main won't go over the two million, um, we won't have a good number. Those are 2017, 2016 numbers, actually probably before that. So we know there's going to be escalation in those costs. I just don't know to what extent. So because, so, um, I mean, Andy's was has been around and I mm -hmm. was, but um, could you provide us that original list that was when I don't even know when that was. That was a while ago. That original list that was published for the community. With input from the 20, community. Uh, what did uh, we vote on? 2014? It was voted 2014. What list? The, the list original we, work list. Project. The original project, project list. list. From the project the, list. You know, that's changed significantly. Oh, yeah. yes. But, okay. you know. Yeah, it's, it's online. It's on, on the our, measure you cite. On our oh, website. Right. Yeah. It's okay. one of the first documents. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll go back and look at it. Yeah. Is there other questions on this item? I have a quick one. So, this... The architect fees are based off what we pay for the project. So anytime the materials increase, like last year when wood tripled, he's getting a portion of that. Well, because it's a fixed lease-lease back 
a maximum uh, a maximum general price contract if the wood escalates and it's it's not built into the contract that he gets that escalation he eats it but, but i think what aaron's saying is, the is, is, is the cost of the wood went up from the original oh, estimate yes, yes. so 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 by the formula we're using his architectural fees are going up proportionally doing nothing to, mm -hmm. for no extra, no extra work, work. So, so mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. that's a good point. And, and it, it might be worth talking to Robert since this is such a big hit and, and look at the, look at the, the cost that we had budgeted originally for these projects. Mm -hmm. And, and his, his bill should be more in line with, with that than it should be with the, with the uh, escalated price. So the the only price he had to go on is written in the contract of the 3.9 million. That's actually in this 2017 agreement. So that's what the 419 is based on and nothing has changed since then. So was that contract for phase 1? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that in 2017 we had estimates for the full phases. But it was written in the contract for phase well, wait, one. Wait, if that was what just for phase one, then that should have ended. No, it doesn't. With phase one. What were the estimates for the second and third phase? I don't have them off the top of my but, head. But, it came but, but what's the, what is, there's a delta. Yeah, it's about difference another. difference between mm -hmm. the estimates for two and three and the actual cost for two and three. Right. Yeah, what so is it, that difference? It's about another 3.2 million delta. So, so that's, a, that's the escalation, cost escalation. It's not just the cost. It's of phase two and three. No, 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 I know. What's yeah, the yeah, difference yeah. between the estimate oh, of the seven? and the actual cost? Right, for this, from the 7.1 to what the estimate was. I don't have that off the top of my head. But uh, it's probably going to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, but it wouldn't have probably, in, if, if it were put in even then, you might have seen an increase here from the original estimate, but it would have been less of a delta than the 311, in my opinion. No, no, it'll be less than the 311, but it's going to be, it'll, the, 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 it, the original fee would be significantly less than the 311,000. Right. So I think it's worth that conversation before we, yeah. I mean, I, I vote we table this. I'd like to uh, say we table this, have the discussion with Robert, and then bring it back to us. And also, we need to reconsider how we do this going forward okay. with anybody else because, mm -hmm. like what Aaron was saying, just because the cost of wood is whatever it is that doesn't mean his work has increased like mm -hmm. his work didn't increase or change just the cost of buying stuff that he didn't even buy somebody else bought like right well for example you know we're we're approving you know four thousand four hundred dollars to put anchor bolts in the weightlifting equipment that's going to be a cost in the project so you getting nine percent of that no so some of those are outside of the of the actual gmp so whatever's outside of the gmp that didn't require design is not included okay this is so only there is separation yeah, yeah there is separation but those are small those are minor the the, ch the the physical change orders that involve design would end up part of this that yeah, he that, had to that would be expected yeah, yeah. um I, I will tell you for summerlin for instance if um the architectural services um, were increased when I redid the whole evaluated budget because, you know, that was like at 3.4 million and it came in at like 7 million. So, you know, this shouldn't happen moving forward. Um, I'm still having them, I'm having staff and I'm working with them to look back at all of the work that's been completed. But, but on Summerlin, as, I mean, if we use that as an example, we got a change order for the additional time that, that, that Dudek was spending and that and that KBZ was spending going back and forth going with back to the count back and forth with the county that yeah. was already built in the budget that number wasn't the, the, no. the original in my, in my the, estimates the the ad additional cost no okay so you you budgeted that and in, in so in, for Summerland I didn't go by contractual I went by I, I el escalated everything and then I built a contingency of about 15% which would cover anything like that that could possibly happen. So I don't think we're going to, we, we have an issue with Summerlin. Um, no, 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 I, I, I'm not saying we do. I'm just saying that, 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 um, you know, that, I mean, 
this is this is the problem with giving a net uh, i mean a percentage of the gross is that there's no <laughs> there's really if the costs increase across the board for construction the architectural fees automatically go up when, even though there's no extra work involved in the project and and um but i think what we i think what what we're getting at is that that because this is such a late big hit why don't we look at what the original estimates were that we were going to pay the nine percent fees on and compare that to the actual costs that we're being charged this additional three hundred and eleven thousand for and look at the difference and and have a discussion with robert on that okay. before we agree to pay this this three hundred and eleven thousand dollar x uh you know increase okay does that I sound fair that. i can do that mm -hmm. okay all right if that's okay with you guys, I mean, is, yeah. that, is that what everybody's in agreement with? Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go ahead and move to table this item until we get further details back from Robert. Is that correct? So, okay. Andy, do you want to make the yeah, motion? Yeah, I, I, I move that we table this until we have more information. Second. All right. Any other questions on that? All right. All those in favor of tabling it? Aye. 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 Thank you, Maureen, for getting more information for us. All right, we'll move on to H4. Uh, the board has to approve the contract with Pacific Material Laborator Laboratory to perform inspection services for Summerlin Elementary School. The scope of work will include, but is not limited to testing and inspection of the following. Concrete placement, epoxy dowel installation, glalom beam fabrication, and shop welding inspection. Is that right? Blue lamb. Blue lamb. <laughs> the total estimated contract is 18370 to be paid with Measure U funds. We get a motion to approve? Move, Move to approve. I'll second. Any questions on this item? Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item I-1 is our personnel summary. We have six assignments, five resignations, four co-curricular assignments, one change in assignment, and two personal side letters. May I get a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we will move on to J, board announcements. Any announcements this evening? All right, our calendar, Monica, I think we have something next Tuesday. Uh, we are going to have the special board meeting expulsion hearing on February 15th at 5.30 at the district office. Okay, now it's in person? Yes. Okay. All right, if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.